Hi guys, thanks for joining. Today I will be talking about hair loss and systemic lupus erythematosus. Lupus is a severe disease with internal organ involvement, but many of my patients say that hair loss is one of the most disturbing symptoms of their disease. So for today, I prepared some information about hair loss and lupus, and then I will finish with some tips on how to treat and prevent hair loss in patients with systemic lupus erythematosus. Let's go! Hair loss may be the first sign of systemic lupus erythematosus. It may precede the development of other symptoms by a year or even more. What are the most common or the most typical symptoms of systemic lupus erythematosus? Well, they have been summarized in the so-called classification criteria. And one of the most important and most consistent findings in patients with systemic lupus erythematosus is the presence of circulating antinuclear antibodies. The clinical symptomatology may vary, however, dermatological abnormalities are quite common in patients with systemic lupus erythematosus. These symptoms include non cicatricial alopecia or hair loss, mucosal erosions, and various forms of cutaneous lupus. However, there are two major symptoms present in patients with systemic lupus erythematosus which are not included in the classification criteria. This is UV hypersensitivity and Raynaud's phenomenon. When focusing on hair loss in systemic lupus erythematosus, one of the common forms is non cicatricial alopecia, which is included in the criteria. However, every patient with systemic lupus erythematosus may develop also discoid lupus erythematosus, which may lead to cicatricial alopecia if it is localized on the scalp. According to the classification criteria, non cicatricial alopecia in the course of systemic lupus erythematosus may be diagnosed when observed by the clinician during a physical examination, but also when reviewing a photograph. And I do not fully agree with the second option because I believe that every patient with hair loss requires a very careful differential diagnosis. Approximately 50% of patients with systemic lupus erythematosus will develop non cicatricial alopecia in the course of the disease. The number in children is a little bit lower, it is around 30%, and these images show some clinical presentations of hair loss in patients with systemic lupus erythematosus. There are three different clinical forms of non cicatricial alopecia in systemic lupus erythematosus. The first and most common form is the diffuse hair loss, but sometimes we see the focal hair loss, which is a little bit similar to alopecia reata, and some patients will develop the so-called lupus hair, which is hair with a tendency to break easily. Here is the relative frequency of some hair abnormalities in systemic lupus erythematosus, and the green bars show the values for the healthy controls, and the yellow bars the results for patients with lupus. So the decreased hair density is visible in approximately half of the patients. Much more common is the hair shaft thinning, and what is not so widely known is that patients with lupus have an increased tendency to develop premature graying of the hair. Trihoscopy in systemic lupus erythematosus will be the topic 
of a different recording, but today I would just like to point to the fact that one of the most common and most consistent findings in trichoscopy in patients with lupus is the presence of thick vessels, which may be arborizing or non-arborizing, but they are present in patients with hair loss and with no hair loss associated with lupus. What is clinically very important is that in systemic lupus erythematosus, alopecia or hair loss is a marker of high disease activity. So when the disease activity increases, the hair loss will be more profound. And as the disease activity decreases, we will see hair regrowth in the course of lupus. Why is this important? This is important because there is no hair specific treatment in lupus erythematosus. When we treat lupus, the hair will regrow. If we do not treat adequately lupus, then no hair directed treatment will be effective. This is a case published some time ago by Gong and coworkers and it shows that successful treatment of lupus is associated with full hair regrowth, even in very severe cases of hair loss. When making the decision about treating a patient with systemic lupus erythematosus and associated hair loss, it is important to consider that some drugs which we use in lupus may also cause drug-induced alopecia. These drugs may have a beneficial effect on hair in patients with lupus because of their immunosuppressive activity, but they may also be an independent factor which is causing hair loss in our patients. I would like to finish with sharing with you some tips on the prevention and treatment of lupus-associated non cicatricial alopecia. I will start with something what is most important, I believe, that in every patient who walks into my office with hair loss, I always exclude lupus. Why? Because hair loss may be the first clinical symptom of systemic lupus erythematosus, and early diagnosis is crucial for early treatment and has an impact on the course of the disease. Second, in a patient with diagnosed systemic lupus erythematosus, it is important to have adequate treatment and good cooperation with the patient because the earlier we achieve remission in the patient, the earlier the hair regrowth will start. Third, we have to keep in mind that hair loss in the patient may be drug induced because many drugs which we use in lupus which we use in lupus may cause hair loss and if we suspect that this is the case we should consider changing the treatment why because if we can change the treatment with no negative impact on lupus in general but with improvement in the hair this will have a significant impact on the quality of life of the patient. Fifth, we should consider discussing with the patient UV protection. There is no literature data to show that UV exposure may cause increased hair loss in patients with lupus, but we know that UV exposure may induce higher disease activity, and with this higher disease activity may cause an increased tendency to hair loss. So I believe that it is important that the patient has adequate UV protection. And of course, it is not only protection of the hair and scalp area, but the whole body surface uh, UV protection. And lastly, and this is the most difficult issue because there are no literature data on this, this is the issue of minoxidil because minoxidil in general, it should be of some help because it increases the length of the anagen phase in the hair cycle. But if we have a patient who has a high concentration of pro-inflammatory cytokines, 
in the circulation, then maybe it will not be a good idea to increase the blood flow around the hair follicle at this moment. So in most cases, I would wait until I have at least some efficacy of the treatment which I started, and then I start minoxidil after a while. I thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to my channel. If you have any comments or questions, I will be very happy to answer. Thanks a lot.